It has been a couple months since WWDC and the unveiling of Apple's upcoming in-house Silicon Max. And Apple itself has stated that the first of these new Intel S computers are right around the corner, if not really soon, jury's still out on that one, certainly by end of year. And while you've likely seen a number of videos from your favorite YouTubers theorizing about what the future may hold, today I want to get down to brass tacks and actually analyze why Apple wants to transition, the hardware that they've engineered to make that transition happen, how software will play a vital role in all of this, and why the transition might not be as picture perfect as they've all led us to believe. Now, this is not Apple's first silicon transition. They moved from 68K to PowerPC in the 90s, and then PowerPC to Intel in the mid-2000s, and, well, now Intel to Apple Silicon. And in a lot of different ways, one could validly argue that the x86 Intel transition was by far the most important, and that it almost single-handedly helped save the Mac in the mid-2000s. Because Apple and IBM's PowerPC chips had been great until they weren't. On one hand, some of the chips like the later generation G4 and G5 were desktop powerhouses, but they had extreme difficulty fitting into notebook style form factors due to heat and power draw. And that was a market that was booming. Performance per watt just wasn't matching Intel or really even close. And then on the other hand, IBM didn't have the economies of scale that Intel did, and so Apple's alleged unit cost made it essentially impossible to compete with PCs on price. So performance was worse, and price was worse. With this price and performance imbalance, a move was necessary. And the transition to Intel, it didn't append the world like a lot of Mac fans had originally estimated. In fact, Intel Macs quickly surpassed what the highest end PowerPC chips were ever capable of. Intel chips, turns out, didn't actually minimize the advantages to Mac OS. It's not like everyone wanted to use Windows now. And the move to Intel actually willed Boot Camp into existence, something that would help curb worries for PC refugees who wanted to try out a Mac, but also needed to occasionally run Windows. Oh, and uh, well, their ads were pretty good. That said, not all good things last forever, and the relationship with Intel began to sour about five years ago, according to Francois Piednel. I for sure butchered his name. But he is an ex-Intel principal engineer, kind of a big deal, who spilled the beans recently during a casual X-Plane game stream. According to him, Apple likely started exploring the possibility of in-house silicon in about 2015 as a result of Intel's abnormally bad quality assurance with the Skylake launch. Uh, he said the following. And basically, our bodies at Apple became the number one filer of problem in the architecture. And that went really, really bad. Uh, like, you know, when, when your customers start finding uh, almost as much bugs as you, you, you found yourself, you're not living into a right place. It's logical to assume that this exploration was only further amplified as Intel continually failed to meet its deadlines. In early 2016, Intel announced to the public that it would be nearing mass production of its new 10 nanometer chip process. It's a big deal. What it meant is that the chips would become more dense and therefore mount more powerful in the same density, in the same package size. And more importantly to someone like Apple, it would be using smaller transistors, which means that the power efficiency increases. Less heat is drawn and less battery is pulled from the CPU. This is excellent for laptops. So then what's the problem? Well, <laughs> Intel had a couple of delays getting 10 nanometer out the door for nearly three years. That's right, they just recently started shipping 10 nanometer Ice Lake laptop CPUs in July of 2020, with no date on the horizon for 10 nanometer desktop processors. Ouch. Now, this is just a personal pet theory of mine, but I think Apple had been banking on Intel releasing 10 nanometer laptop SKUs way earlier than they did. Why? Well, the 2016 MacBook Pro redesign went to a thinner form factor with lesser cooling capacity that massively thermally throttled the machine. And this was present through the MacBook Pro lineup for years, basically even still in some instances. Is it reasonable to assume that Apple had designed the laptop expecting more efficient chips that just never came? Maybe. It might also explain why the non-Retina MacBook Air stayed stagnant in the lineup for years, waiting for something new that just never arrived. 
Now make no mistake, I don't let Apple off the hook because ultimately they are the ones responsible for shipping good products. But I do suspect that Intel's delays and failed promises may have accelerated the release of the inevitable shift to in-house silicon, especially considering the fact that Tim Cook is a supply chain guy and he does not want his product release cycle dictated by laggard partners. Now, moving Apple silicon production in-house does in fact create a number of competitive advantages. Number one, Apple no longer has to compete with other OEMs for the same chips. Apple is not Intel's number one priority by volume, not even close. That would go to Dell and Lenovo. They're leagues ahead. Number two, they no longer have to negotiate a feature set that other OEMs, like Dell and Lenovo, may not be interested in. For example, integrated graphics, which Apple pushed Intel to develop really heavily in the early 2010s, instead of opting for more power-hungry, dedicated GPUs, is an example where Apple won, but in other instances, they likely haven't. Number three, shifting to Apple's own in-house production gives iOS apps the ability to run natively on this hardware because they're ARM. There's no translation layer or software modification required. More on that in a minute. And number four, vertical integration and complete control of hardware and software gives Apple the ability to do something that basically no other computer maker has been able to do in decades. So let's talk about the hardware, shall we? What Macs can we expect to come first and what will their performance be relative to what Apple's currently shipping? Well, to answer that, I think it's important to look at the DTK or Developer Transition Kit. You know, that Mac Mini Apple announced during the keynote that you and I can't purchase, but that developers can to make sure that their apps are ready for ARM. Excuse me, Apple Silicon. The DTK is running an A12Z chip, which is the same SoC found in the 2020 iPad Pro, which is basically the same chip as the A12X found in the 2018 iPad Pro. The only difference between the two is that the A12Z has one additional GPU core that was also present but disabled in the A12X because binning. If you want to learn more info on silicon and how chip binning and all of that other processes are, are handled, well, check out my video here. There's one big reason that this DTK and A12Z is so important. And well, that's because it's really the only hardware that we have to go off of right now. But here's the thing, even though it's a two-year-old iPad chip, which will never be made into a real consumer Mac, and Craig Federici confirmed this much in the keynote, the results are impressive, especially in x86 emulation. Now, hold on, what are you talking about? Well, in order to gracefully bridge the gap between the x86 outgoing architecture and the new incoming ARM or Apple Silicon architecture, Apple has developed Rosetta 2, which is a huge compatibility software layer that will allow you to run existing x86 binaries or apps on these new ARM Macs. Now, realistically, Apple wants developers to recompile their apps to just run natively on ARM. And luckily, they've done a really good job in the last few years pushing developers to Xcode and high-level coding languages that use Apple-developed compilers. What this means is that the transition from x86 to ARM will be much easier and quicker than the move from PowerPC to Intel, which really wasn't that bad either. Now, on your new Apple Silicon Mac, you probably won't know or care if the app that you're using is executing native code or using the Rosetta translation layer, which is good. That's the whole point. The reason I'm talking about it at all is that by using a DTK and Rosetta 2 apps, we can get a feel for how powerful these ARM Macs are going to be, at least initially. Early benchmarks posted by developers who had the DTK and violated their NDA showed impressive results within about 20% of the native iPad Pro ARM benchmark, even without using the four low power cores. They only utilized the four high power cores. That's kind of how these chips work. They're eight core, but four are high power, four are low power. Now, some people diss the results, but it's like, this is literally a two-year-old iPad chip running inside this weirdo dev kit, running a beta OS inside of an emulated or translated benchmark. What were you expecting? <laughs> what is monumental is the following. Even though the DTK didn't match the iPad Pro running the ARM benchmark natively, and of course it wouldn't, it still outperformed the Surface Pro X with the Qualcomm Microsoft SQ1 ARM processor running the same benchmark natively. And additionally, the GPU cores found inside of the A12Z inside of this weirdo dev kit uh, actually outperformed the Ryzen 4500U laptops in an OpenCL test. That's also really impressive. 
So let's digest this all for a minute, okay? The A14 SoC that'll make its way into the new iPhone will have a rumored 15 billion transistors on a five nanometer process. And that's up from the A13's eight and a half billion transistors on the larger seven nanometer process. Now, the rumored implications of this are huge, a 30% increase in speed and efficiency, in addition to the Silicon team's annual improvements and optimizations. This is just for the iPhone. So if we assume two additional cores for the A14X iPad variant, as has been true in the past, along with double the GPU core count from four to eight, this would put performance near the top of the single core charts in Geekbench in nearly every performance category. And in multi-core scores, it would nearly match the performance of the octa-core Intel i9-9980H laptop CPU in extended multi-core workloads when running natively compiled ARM apps. And it will do it with significantly less power draw and heat generation because after all, this is gonna be an iPad iPad chip. <laughs> now, let's say they take that exact chip, the A14X, the iPad chip, and throw it inside of a MacBook Pro. Native apps will run basically the same as iPad, but even the emulated x86 apps will be expected to run around the same speed as the 2019 13-inch MacBook Pro with i7-8559U processor. This is extraordinarily impressive. However, I do think that we need to keep our expectations in check. I think a lot of people believe Apple's gonna come in balls blazing and unveil a computer with the same compute power as like, I don't know, a Ryzen 3700X in a laptop the size of MacBook Air. Look, it's not gonna happen. My prediction is the following. Apple announces a new ARM Mac later this year in a form factor that we're already familiar with, like the 13-inch MacBook Air or 13-inch MacBook Pro. Now the machine will use a chip based off of the new A14 chip, and it will provide similar, if not marginally better performance than the outgoing Intel MacBook Pro. So what will they advertise as the selling point if it's only a little bit faster? Well, they'll advertise a thinner, fanless design with extraordinarily good battery life. And because it runs native iOS apps, <laughs> it might even get a touchscreen. Oh, and it's still gonna be faster. When running ARM benchmarks, it will be like 40% faster. So that will be an impressive thing to say on stage. Look, I too hope that this is all wrong and that the first Apple Silicon Mac uses a Mac-specific chip not derived from the A14 that just obliterates every laptop on the market. And look, that may happen eventually. The implications of Apple Silicon are massive and so it could happen into the future, but I expect this first year to be a little slow. Expect a low TDP, relatively low performance laptop to come first, and then lower end iMacs to come, and then finally we'll get high performance machines like the Mac Pro very last. I mean, look, imagine an ARM Mac Pro with the ability to add all sorts of crazy expansion slots like independent CPU cores or FPGAs to help in specific workloads. The options are limitless once Apple is in charge of their own architecture designs. I think stuff like that afterburner card available in Mac Pro that's utilized for ProRes workflows, that's just the beginning of this all. And it is not inconceivable to me that it will be possible to build a Mac Pro in the future tailored exactly to your specific workload on bare metal, rather than having to buy a generic CPU and trying to make stuff work in software. Boy, that would be neat, wouldn't it? Then again, maybe they won't because Apple has demonstrated time and time again, uh, especially in the mobile space, that while their CPUs are special, sure, they're really optimized in software. And it's the optimization of hardware to run code where Apple's products truly begin to shine. This transition is going to be an exciting one, and you can bet that we're gonna be covering it here on Snazzy Labs later this year. So get subscribed if you haven't already, and enable the bell notification so you don't miss any new videos. We have some really exciting ones coming soon. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Is the new Apple Silicon Mac gonna be crazy insane, or is it going to be relatively modest? If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you didn't, well, that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome videos like this one, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.